Good afternoon, everybody. It's Peter Berry here from Sydney. Uh, I want to welcome you to uh, our exchange today. The title is Agile Leadership and it's important in today's environment and it's never been so important. So I'm Peter Berry, the Managing Director of Peter Berry Consultancy. We are the Hogan uh, distributor in Australia and we've been driving the engine room of uh, 360 products in association with Hogan over the last 10 years. Today, I am probably going to make seven key points. So I thought I'd give you an executive summary to start with. Then I've got a PowerPoint. It's uh, 26 slides and hopefully you'll find it uh, informative and engaging. And uh, at the end of about 40 minutes or, or so, I will stop and we can take some questions. Uh, firstly, a couple of thank yous. We've got the Mexican Hogan distri distribution team, Victoria, who uh, is a brilliant lady. We've got our friends from the States, and of course, we've got some very good associates here in Australia who are here today. So let's talk about Agile, and I'll give you the big picture of my thinking that will uh, be the platform for the PowerPoint. One, uh, Agile is permanent. Uh, organisations around the world were already moving towards Agile, uh, being an industry disruptor, uh, introducing tribes, cross-functional ways of improving productivity and customer service. And now with COVID-19 and the recession, everybody has to be Agile, uh, but not everybody does it well. So the two Agile tools, both assessment and uh, which is personality and 360, uh, are just perfect in today's environment for measuring leadership capability and opening up the key to improvement. The second thing I wanna share with you is our Agile leadership model. We love to be in the thought leadership space and uh, it's great to be able to share a model with you in which we can put Agile and how it's meant to drive leadership performance, engagement and bottom line results. The third thing I want to do is a little bit reflective. Uh, I want to share the four big things that have shaped uh, the PBC and Hogan experience in the last 30 years to get to 2020 today, where we think assessments are absolutely critical uh, if you're going to measure uh, and improve leadership effectiveness. Um, a little bit indulgent, but a little bit of history too. Uh, fourthly, I want to just revisit some of the statistics on why so many change programs fail. Big lessons for today around uh, being agile and wanting agile to be successful, but there's a history there of uh, 70 to 80 percent of change programs not delivering the full intent. And I want to pick out some of the lessons for today's environment. Um, the fifth point, I want to touch on uh, what are the latest trends and best practices in the 360 market. Clearly, uh, products ought to have reliability and validity. They've got to have global benchmarks. They can't just be thought bubbles. Uh, there's got to be science and rigor and evidence, uh, technical manuals. And uh, we pride ourselves in PBC and in Hogan on having the very highest standards of scientific rigor. Um, sixthly, I want to talk to you about some good news. And the good news for me is that uh, agile or agility can be measured. We have uh, uh, the Hogan personality assessment. We have uh, the 360 assessment, put those two together and uh, you have captured an individual manager. You can do it for the whole management team and then you've got all that management data. So there's a baseline of how agile uh, are we and what are the opportunities to improve. Uh, it's perfect for uh, coaching, perfect for doing team building, perfect as part of a leadership development program and uh, assessments order to inform uh, development. The final point is I want to give you some tips about surviving in uh, the agile environment today. It's tough, really, really tough. Certain industries have got growth opportunities like food and medical, but for most of us, we're having to tighten our belts, work from home, uh, save money. And uh, I want to share some brand new research in PVC, looking at uh, the most recent update to our 360 database and what the benchmarks are showing. So we're going to have a look at what separates the very best leaders from the rest of the pack and look at tips for helping teams to become more agile. So with that introduction, let me get stuck into the PowerPoint and uh, please enjoy the experience, take some notes and, uh, and I hope you get some good takeaways. So the agile operating, in operating environment, it's not a fad, it's become a business imperative. It's a way of survival. Our world has turned upside down 
And I describe Agile as having an entrepreneurial mindset to stay ahead of the market, whether it's the economic recession, uh, the impact of uh, uh, COVID-19. You've got to have a mindset that says we're change ready, we've got a vision, we've got a strategy, and, uh, and we, want to, we want to come out of this in good shape. So uh, the third dot point, it's a new way of working, but there's a big red flag here. Many efforts to achieve uh, change in the past have produced less than optimum results. Key lessons, we have ineffective leadership at the individual or, or, or team level. We have dysfunctional teams. Teams can be good to great, but a lot are damn ordinary. And we often have poor employee engagement, even communicating and creating a burning platform can be challenges and more about that one later on. And our experience with big corporates, it can take one to three years to get full enterprise wide agility. And I'm currently working with a couple of big multinationals. It's often two steps forward and one step back. Uh, it's easier said than done. But the operating environment is definitely agile. If you're not agile, um, you're in yesterday's world. Uh, today, what are the current uh, issues we're faced with? Uh, it's a perfect storm when you combine the health pandemic, the economic recession, for God's sake, I hope it's not a depression. Uh, it is the most challenging period I've ever seen in my lifetime. Uh, it's damn hard. Businesses are shutting down. People are working from home. We're operating virtually. And uh, I think only agile organisations will survive and prosper and, and come out at the other end. The agile operating environment, I like to take a holistic approach uh, to, to looking at the whole of agile. Uh, the first stop point, our business strategy has to be crystal clear. So typically we have a longer term strategy, three to five years, we turn it into a one year business plan. We cascade the KPIs down throughout the organisation. So it's one team, one plan, there's a clear line of sight. The big change I've noticed just in the last couple of weeks, we need to be agile, a 30 day time frame, a 60 day time frame, a three month calendar. We've gone back to being very, very short term and nimble to achieve uh, some of the, the, the massive um, challenges that have been thrown at us now. We still have to do that consistently with the bigger picture, but we need a laser focus on what's gonna get us through the next 30, 60, 90 days. Uh, the second uh, circle, in parallel to the strategy, we need to be able to deliver that strategy. So we need an agile culture of employee engagement. Are our employees for change or against change? Uh, are our employees highly engaged or disengaged? The global research shows that two thirds of people are engaged, one third are disengaged, and half of one, those one third are sharing their misery with their co-workers. So they're like what I call the bottom 10%, uh, the vinegar drinkers, uh, the people who suck lemons for morning tea with a complaining disposition. So we've got to pay attention more than ever to culture, engagement, uh, tap into the feelings and emotions of our people. Uh, we've got to have a strong culture. If you don't have a good culture, it can defeat your strategy. Um, and the third dot point, the red one, you've got to look at your structure. The structure has to be lean and mean, cross-functional, uh, networked. We've got to avoid silos. Uh, silos will be the enemy. Uh, otherwise, having a bad structure can defeat the strategy and the culture we're trying to build. So that's my holistic model. Uh, we need to be working on all three of those at the same time. This is a PBC uh, thought leadership piece. Uh, I call it the LEAP model. It's just a little acronym for leadership, engagement, agility and performance. So when we talk about agile, we talk about it in the context of bottom line results. Uh, it's not just something we want to do as a fad. So let's take that top uh, little box called the CEO and executive team. Um, uh, they are responsible for three things in this current environment. One, they've got to be measuring leadership. So measure leadership effectiveness, and you do that through personality assessments and 360. We've then got to improve agile effectiveness, and the good news is it can be learned, trained, coached. We've then got to look at leadership as uh, the team, we have a quote that leadership is about results, teams deliver results, judge the leader by the team. So we actually wanna measure the team effectiveness, the functionality, um, where is that team on the spectrum of good to great? And we wanna then improve the agility uh, of that team effectiveness. That's where assessments can play a big part. Personality, uh, 360 and high-performing team assessments. 
Then you've got strategy in the middle. You've got to have your short and long-term planning. You've got to have a planning cycle with quarterly reviews, so we're being strategic, not just operational. Uh, I've made a point already that we're doing 30-day, 60-day, 90-day planning because we are flying into headwinds, most of us, and uh, there's a lot of turbulence out there. Then the third point under strategy is you've got to constantly look at your structure. So agile organisations are breaking down barrier barriers, creating cross-functional teams, uh, building the networks, getting shared goals, but easier said than done. Uh, there's a lot of cultural barriers in bringing that uh, to place. Then you've got technology and processes. You know, we're all learning about new technology, more efficient processes, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of benefits there when we come out of the end of this uh, uh, the, the, this current challenging time. Then you've got people. Uh, hire the best people. Uh, hire hard, manage easy. The onboarding, the motivation, the development, the career opportunities, all of that leads to two things, retention and performance. And that's the name of the game when it comes to people, uh, keeping the best people and having them as high performers. And what we've got to do as part of an agile environment is really manage our talent. And uh, managing the talent is all about assessments, uh, starting with some science, drawing a line in the sand, and that opens the way for self-awareness, self-regulation, coaching, and, and sharing in a team. Now, if you do all of those three, three things right, you should get agile performance. And agile performance still needs to be a balanced scorecard. So we want to see four things, the employee engagement, the, the customer satisfaction, the service and operational excellence, and your financial results. I've just got a tiny little line at the bottom of this slide where I'm suggesting there's five best practice assessments in the marketplace. We can measure personality, and we think the Hogan's is the gold standard. Uh, we've got the 360, various iterations of the 360. We have a high performing team assessment, which is fantastic for capturing uh, the strengths and opportunities for a team. And then we have uh, employee engagement measures, uh, all the big multinationals, whether it's Glint, um, uh, Culture Ramp, uh, Sorota, uh, very sophisticated ways of measuring employee engagement. Um, and again, I've already mentioned that it shows two thirds are engaged and one third are disengaged. So how do you manage those one third who are disengaged in this agile environment? Huge challenge. And then you've got to have your customer satisfaction metrics. Um, so that's our little model. And it's all about connecting those. So the point of leadership is to drive strategy, engage with people to produce bottom line results. And uh, that model applies even more so now because of uh, the current environment. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you about the 360 market. Uh, I'm, I, I, I live and breathe this. It's my passion. Uh, any research I can get my hands on, uh, I love it. The first point is something that Dr. Robert Hogan and I totally agree on. Leadership is observable, it's measurable, and it's improvable by understanding personality, performance, and reputation. So down the bottom of this slide on the left, I actually think if you want to evaluate a leader, um, it's all about understanding their core personality. It's all this understanding their chosen behaviour or learned behaviour that can be conscious or unconscious. Um, and put those two together, and that's how other people see you. It's your brand or your reputation. So I describe personality assessments as what's below the waterline, and then the 360s are what's happening above the waterline. Put the two together, it's the most cost effective uh, quickest and most powerful way to measure um, leadership effectiveness for an individual or a team of managers. Um, and remember Daniel Goleman, the EQ guru, he said uh, EQ starts with self-awareness, then self-regulation, then being motivated. So on the right hand side, if we combine the Agile 360 with the Agile Leader uh, Report, which is the personality measure, that's the most powerful, sharpest, quickest way to, uh, to measure the baseline uh, of one's competencies and reputation here. And then with self-awareness, coaching, motivation, practice, we can improve an individual and a team. Um, and I guess the point I'm making here is assessments must underpin uh, the whole approach to self-awareness and improvement and behavioural change. Uh, I put this book up. Uh, these two authors are very, very good. Uh, and it's all about learning leadership. So sometimes leadership, nature and nurture, but for most of us it's practice, practice, and then keep practicing. So uh, becoming a better leader involves becoming a better learner. And that's something we have to test with leaders. Are you open to learning? Are you open to feedback? 
particularly in an agile environment, you need to be aware of your behaviour. Um, we all know the dark side. The dark side comes out during periods of stress when we perhaps can't self-regulate. And uh, this current environment with COVID-19, the recession, uh, it's turned our world upside down. There will be a lot of managers that derail. Their, their dark side will, will, will trump uh, their bright side. So now more than ever, we need this self-awareness and, and the learning agenda. The second uh, point there, leadership in this book is not so much about personality, it's about behaviour. And uh, they make the point that behaviour can be learned. Uh, it takes practice, it takes uh, motivation, you're building new mental muscles, and then it becomes second nature and you, your comp competence goes up, your confidence goes up, and, and your career success. Um, I've made the point in, in this second uh, uh, paragraph that technical leadership is not enough. Uh, so we have a lot of smart people in businesses. They can be engineers, lawyers, builders, manufacturers, uh, doctors. Uh, you've got to impose emotional intelligence on top of the technical leadership. So we've got the hard skills, the soft skills, the, the capability, the likability, whatever language you want to use. Um, and then I've finished this slide by saying self-awareness is the starting point for building that leadership effectiveness. Too many leaders have blind spots. Some leaders are clueless. Some are very self-aware, uh, but getting a good 360 will actually tell you uh, how did the self ratings compare to the other ratings? Um, are you pretty self-aware? Have you been open to coaching for most, most of your career? Uh, uh, but I love the point that leadership can be learned. It's a journey and uh, practice makes perfect. The four big things. Um, I was lucky. I got to go to Switzerland last year to help launch the Agile Leader, uh, the 360. Uh, it's been developed uh, in, with our, in partnership with our German distributor. And uh, I reflected on the four big things that have got us uh, to this time and place where assessments underpin our practices. So let me just share a little bit of thought leadership with you. Uh, doctors Robert and Joyce Hogan opened the business in 1987. They were academics, brilliant psychologists, and uh, they uh, the big point they made is there is a science around personality. Science uh, personality can be measured. Uh, up until 1987, uh, most academics said there's no such thing as being able to measure personality. So within 10 years, the Hogans gave us the bright side, the dark side, the inside. And Bob wrote that dysfunctional behaviour can impair one's efforts to get along and get ahead. Uh, Bob wrote uh, that 12 published estimates of the base rate of managerial failure, it's between 30 to 67 per cent, uh, an average of about 50. Uh, that still correlates today with research from Gallup that shows that 50 per cent of disengagement in the workforce can come from having a bad leader. Um, so what do we do? Uh, that we use the personality assessments that led to the introduction of 360s so you could understand the why and the what together. So uh, thank God for Dr. Robert Hogan, uh, still alive and well today, still passionate and uh, still sort of still uh, giving us that bridge to go from uh, science to practice with the use of the assessments. The second big thing that happened, which informed my own development as a consultant, in 1988, uh, in America, we had uh, the Malcolm Baldrige Business Excellence Model. Uh, it was the first time we had a holistic framework for looking at business. Uh, it was then followed by the European Quality Awards in 89, and then we had the Australian Quality Awards here at the same time. It said there's seven things to running a great business. There was leadership, strategy, measurement, people, customers, operations, and results. And the big breakthrough is this was the first business model that established a causal link between leadership, people and business outcomes. So uh, leadership drives engagement, engagement drives performance, and that is still the case today with the current Baldridge model. So uh, it was a balanced scorecard, the best balanced scorecard, and uh, it got us thinking about how to measure leadership, which a year earlier, Dr. Robert Hogan was uh, banging on about. Then the third big thing in 1996, Daniel Goleman published his uh, uh, break, uh, breakthrough book called Emotional Intelligence, why it can uh, uh, contribute more than IQ to one's success. Daniel Goleman didn't invent EQ. There were other authors like uh, Salovey uh, earlier that were talking about social skills different from IQ, uh, but Daniel Goleman popularized it. 
And he said there's five elements of EQ, self-awareness, self-regulation, being motivated and uh, being able to, do, to build and sustain relationships by demonstrating empathy and uh, social skill. Uh, with the agile reports today, and this is now a long time on, we still measure the soft skills and the hard skills. So that's the importance of understanding a little bit about the EQ. Uh, I've been working with a couple of my clients just in the last couple of weeks who are very, very distressed. And uh, EQ is clearly emerging as a leadership competency in these very, very uh, challenging times. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that our products uh, do measure those soft skills as well as the hard skills. The fourth big thing was uh, by about 2000, uh, Gallup, Aon, Hewitt, Sorota, Glint, uh, some very powerful, sophisticated uh, psychological constructs around employee engagement were, were emerging. Business started to take employee engagement seriously. Gone were the days of Henry Ford saying, leave your brains in the car park. Uh, now we want the brains, we want the heart, we want the capability, we want the whole package. But uh, for example, um, these surveys showed that one third of employees are disengaged. They're ready to quit their boss, the team or the job. And Gallup says that 70% uh, of the variance in engagement can be attributed to the team manager. So that's why it's so important in today's market to be using assessments to measure the impact of the manager. So with Agile, we measure the personality, then we measure the 360, and that gives us that baseline of uh, what's, what is the leadership capability and what needs to be added uh, to their repertoire. Um, so they were the four things that have really led to us today in 2020, talking to you about uh, the Agile products and uh, how we need to use those products to drive all of the things that we've been learning um, with those four big things. Um, so a little bit about the 360 market, and I'll say a little bit more about this later on. Um, the first dot point here is something that uh, Dr. Robert Hogan and I agree on 100%. We're joined at the hip, and we're on the same page. Leadership drives engagement, which in turn drives performance. So if we come back to the current operating environment and how tough it is today, if we want to get the performance now more than ever, We've got to understand the causal link between effective leadership, driving the engagement through employee engagement and customer satisfaction to keep producing results. So if we've got poor leaders, if we've got dysfunctional leadership teams, if we've got leaders that are going to show a dark side because of the stressful period, we've got to understand the impact it's going to have. We've got to be able to measure the return on investment. That's why at the moment, uh, people and business analytics is a hot topic. Uh, everybody wants to do it well, but I've seen some research that only about 17% of companies are measuring effectively the link between their people analytics, uh, the business outcomes and the causal link that leadership plays in driving this. The engagement surveys uh, all around the world, the ones that I've mentioned show that engagement has a very positive impact. Uh, the financials look good. Uh, the customer is a lot happier. Uh, the productivity and safety goes up the employee retention and absenteeism and wellness, um, even employee retention. If an average employee leaves, the, the, the replacement cost is about $50,000. So if you've got high staff turnover, it's a killer. And if you've got retention of your best people, it definitely goes straight to the bottom line. So we make the point uh, at the bottom of this slide that leadership should be measured by personality assessments, 360 reviews and team assessments. We have the pleasure of working with Shell Shell globally, they're a very big multinational. They use Hogan personality assessments. They use the Hogan 360 and uh, they use team assessments and they've plotted that causal link between leadership, engagement and bottom line results. And uh, we're working with them now to perhaps put together a little white paper and, and share some of that success story. Um, so measurement uh, plays a critical role in driving um, um, success. Um, high performing teams. Uh, Bob Hogan came up with a quote many years ago uh, where the team should be a reflection of the leader uh, because leadership is about results. Teams deliver results, therefore judge the leader by the team. So we're proud to have the high performing team assessment. Um, and you can also use agile personality and 360 on all the team members to get that data and share it. Uh, high performing teams have trust. They have vulnerability. They should be prepared to share their data. 
and support each other through these difficult times uh, bond together. So the first slide here, leadership is about results, teams deliver results, judges the leader by the team. Um, on your way up the corporate ladder, it's often about your own performance. So a highly diligent person will be you know, working hard, uh, being a perfectionist, but once you get to leading people, you might be micromanaging. And that's, that's being a manager, not a leader anymore. And it could be disempowering. Um, Patrick Lencioni, I think everybody's probably heard of Patrick Lencioni, uh, the five dysfunctions of teams. He introduced that word dysfunctions of teams. Uh, Bob Hogan was writing about dysfunctions a long time before Patrick to do with the dark side. But many C-suite leaders do not know how to build high performing teams. They're not trained at university to build a high performing team. Uh, it's a soft skill where they'd rather sort of uh, focus on their IQ. And often we, in an organisation, we end up with silos and uh, there's a them and us and finger pointing and uh, it's all very depressing. Most managers can tell you a horrible period in their life where they reported to an ineffective leader and their team was dysfunctional and they say we never want to go back to that. The third thought bubble, the red one, agile results will only come through employee engagement and high performing teams. So please think about the impact of all of this on the workforce. Uh, teams are a, a, a key unit of performance. Those teams should be high performing and measured regularly. Uh, and the, the employee engagement, you must be measuring it uh, with a baseline score. And, and then most importantly, backtrack and find out what drives that employee engagement. And I've already given you my thoughts on that. So please think about high performing teams. Uh, a great intervention would be to use the agile assessments, both the personality and the 360 for a management team. And, and have a little half day workshop, uh, share the results, provided there's a, a trusting environment, make sure it's uh, professionally facilitated and they will get so much out of the, the two agile uh, assessments. Um, I mentioned before that many change programs fail and agile is all about delivering change, delivering it quickly. And with COVID-19 and the recession, we've never had to deliver better results so quickly I can't think of another time in my in my life, and I've been around for a while, as you can see. So John Connor, uh, a brilliant academic from Harvard Business School, he's written the books around leading change, and he says that change efforts fail primarily because of poor leadership. So here we have it: leadership's the engine room, and assessments is the key to measuring leadership and being able to improve it. Then in the purple, he says behaviour change of your workforce is the ultimate challenge. And he says, you've got to deal with people's emotions and feelings. So I'm encouraging my clients at the moment um, who are in survival mode, tap into your people's feelings and emotions. Ask people how they're feeling. Uh, Socialise those emotions. Um, get them on the table uh, and support it. So um, a, a lot of good leaders do this naturally. It is a skill that can be learned and become a habit. Uh, but some managers who might may trade on the high IQ and technical skills and, and not like people uh, find this very difficult to do, but it can be learned and, and coached. Uh, the Harvard Business School, uh, with the, the leading change, some of the research from Cotter and the other academics in Boston said 70% of change programs can fail. So the lesson for me is what if 70% of uh, change programs fail today in the current environment. It means we don't get the strategy right, we haven't got the right leadership being displayed, we're not engaging people, we're not communicating, we're not on the same page, it's all becoming dysfunctional and, and we're all derailing. And uh, what Cotter said is one, complacency can be a killer. So where's your burning platform? So I think now more than ever, we have burning platforms. They've just got to be articulated as a threat or an opportunity. There's got to be a vision and a purpose given to, to middle managers and employees to get their buy-in. Um, two, there's a lack of C-suite commitment. Uh, what does it mean? Senior leaders go back to running their own silo. They're not interested in the big picture. They're selfish, they're narrow-minded, and they're looking after their own patch. Number three, the strategic plan is not focused. It doesn't cascade down into second tier plans or KPIs. It hasn't been adapted. Remember earlier I said a 30 day plan, a 60 day plan, a 90 day plan. Now more than ever, we need short term plans consistent with the longer term plan and they may need to be communicated and, 
and win the hearts and minds. Number four is about the employee engagement. Uh, one third are disengaged and uh, I just don't know how we're going to motivate those people in the current crisis, except try, try harder and, and keep at it. Uh, some more depressing news, McKinsey's uh, who have a, uh, a brilliant reputation for their research. They talk about a 70% failure rate today as well. The major issues are employee resistance and ineffective leadership. So ineffective leadership can be measured with the agile assessments. Let's get that baseline. What is your core personality? What is your 360, your reputation at work? And, uh, and let's get cracking on an improvement journey so that you can overcome the employee resistance. A lot of consistency in some of the themes coming through here. Um, IBM, they quote a 60% failure rate. They're a little bit more optimistic than the others. That's good, a little bit of optimism amongst some gloom and doom. And what do they say? The biggest issues are poor executive sponsorship. In other words, the change program is not driven from the top clearly enough, not enough communication, and again, poor employee engagement. Okay, so there's some lessons learned. Uh, change uh, is easier said than delivered. Um, and we've, we've got to be really resilient, we've got to be tough, we've got to be focused. The 360 market, uh, I want to share just a little bit about what I've picked up in the last couple of years and then we can talk about Agile. 360 assessments were originally designed for individual feedback and no one else got to see the report. Now it's a mainstream HR practice. It's being used to drive behavioural reputational change. It's all around delivering return on investment. Uh, the two biggest returns on investment are employee engagement and business outcomes. That's connecting your, your people and business analytics to get that causal link. The third dot point, uh, 360s are now used to uh, inform promotions, compensation, identification of high potentials, succession planning, and it's being done in a more open and rigorous way. Uh, so my tip to everybody on this call, if you were looking to use the Agile personality assessment and the 360, it can be used to inform uh, the whole life cycle of uh, what I'm talking about on this slide. The 360 market, uh, the market is stronger. Most organisations in the world are using 360s, but they're not just looking to drive high performing teams and employee engagement, they're looking to deliver the strategic business plan. Uh, the KPIs have to be the key outcome. So uh, uh, organisations are now looking for return on investment of, of, on the 360s. How do you measure return on investment? By individual performance, you're achieving your KPIs, the team is high performing and you've got really good employee engagement with, for example, uh, low turnover, good safety, whatever those KPIs might be. Then the third dot point, I just love the world of analytics. It's fantastic. Uh, the challenge is connecting people data with operational and financial data. And uh, like I mentioned with Shell, where we're getting some key insights into the effectiveness of a leader uh, with the high performing team and the employee engagement and your bottom line results. And we've even in Shell done an exercise where a poor leader was put in charge of a high performing team and within six months to destroyed the employee engagement and the KPIs went backward. So we, we know unequivocally that leadership is the key uh, to do these outcomes. And it starts with measuring leadership. Um, some other trends, uh, the coaching it has moved from a one-off to a six to 12 month period. So if you're interested in using agile assessments, think about more than a one-off debrief or coaching, perhaps potentially make it over six months to start with. So there's several touch points. Uh, for senior managers, the coach is usually sourced externally, not internally. In fact, senior people would prefer uh, an impartial outside uh, coach. Uh, we're looking for uh, two competencies, that the coach has business capability and understanding and has experience as a coach. They're the two KPIs when you're picking your coaches. And uh, what we're also doing these days is we're sharing more of the 360 data. We ask you to share it with your manager. In fact, your manager might be involved in one of the coaching sessions and you should be sharing the outcomes with your direct reports in your team. Um, a 360 should measure self-awareness. So the great thing is in our 360s, you measure the self ratings against the selected raters and you find that sometimes people are overconfident, a little bit bold or narcissistic. Uh, you find that they lack self-confidence and they've been really hard on their scores. And that's got to be a, a good outcome from a good, robust 360. Then you've got your manager ratings, your peers, your reports. So how am I going with my manager? 
how am I seen by my peers, good or a silo? And the report ratings are fantastic because it's the first indication you can see is of am I leading a high performing team? Have I got good employee engagement with my group? Therefore, I can run the agile agenda. My team is change ready. Um, then the third dot point, strategic self-awareness comes from benchmarking one's results against an external benchmark. Uh, a 360 is useless unless it's got a global external benchmark. Uh, I've seen too many organisations design their own internal 360. It, it lacks validity. Uh, uh, it, uh, it has no benchmarks. So therefore you get a result, which probably means not much at all. Uh, so there's got to be a lot of science and rigour in the way we go about using our assessments, um, even having the, 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 the technical manuals to prove the validity is absolutely key. So uh, uh, a couple of points here, still talking about trends in the 360 market. The scientific rigour around 360 assessments is improving. Uh, the market's getting educated. We're, we're not copying rubbish anymore, stuff that's made up at home and, and uh, uh, just because we want to design our own leadership competency framework without any science to it. Um, and at PBC, we, uh, we have a strong research team. We work closely with the Hogan folk in Tulsa, uh, the head office of Hogan, and everything we do has the highest standards of technical validity. Um, the second point here, the 360 has got to be supported by a technical manual, and, and we have technical manuals for the Agile products. Um, and it's got to prove that there's reliability and validity. And then the benchmarks are important, just so you know where you stand and how do I compare to others. And, and um, so, for example, in Shell, uh, they aim for their managers uh, as a goal to get them to the 75th percentile. They just don't want ordinary managers at the 50 percentile. They want to encourage their managers to be the very best. Um, so uh, those benchmarks are just fantastic. Um, so congratulations uh, to our Agile partners, uh, Meta Beratung, the, the German and Swiss operator. We love working with Nicole and the team over there. They did a great job of working with Hogan and IMD, a very prestigious business school, to develop the personality assessment. Then they worked with us to develop the 360. And uh, so world-class assessments, gold standard, great research. And I've got to share a little insight with you. Uh, the personality assessment is deadly accurate because the results on the screen is me. So a little bit of self-disclosure, a little bit of humility. Apparently I don't have much, uh, but this was my personality assessment. Humility came out at 17. I do have a little bit of high recognition, sociability and bold in my makeup. Adaptability, I got 73. I can move fast. I can be agile. Visionary, apparently I am quite strategic. Maybe that's the key to starting PBC 30 years ago and still going strong today. And engaging came out at 71. I do care about people and uh, I, I try to do that well. So I just have to watch the humility. Don't come across as arrogant, know it all, make sure you can listen. So sometimes you look in the mirror, and you don't like everything you see, but this is the science of the assessment. And then, um, uh, measuring the competencies and behaviours, we then go inside the circle. Uh, I'm hyper aware. I can understand the external environment. I can execute at speed. I can move very quickly, but sometimes I make poor decisions. My natural personality says there might not be too much science or data behind my decision making. And I can be honest with you and say I have made some poor decisions in the last 10 years, whether it's a hiring decision, a commercial decision, uh, a lack of judgment over here, because I'm probably a little bit hot blooded. So if you want to have a laugh, you can look at my warning there. I got a warning for careless driving. Isn't that beautiful? Just being a bit too fast, a little bit too reckless, a little bit too intuitive. But apart from that, I'm pretty agile. So uh, my wife says I tend to look at my strengths, not my weaknesses. And anyway, there it is right in front of you. So that's fantastic. So the whole report itself, uh, uh, I've got a, a, a mock sample report here. It's a beautiful little report. It's not too turgid, it's not too long. Uh, it, it's, it's really cool. It's been beautifully done. Okay, then we move on to the 360, which is a, a collaboration between PBC, IMD and Meta Beratung. 
and uh, this is your HL 360. Uh, I've got a sample report here. I do think it's a, it's a really cool report. Uh, it's not long, it's only 13 pages, so keep it simple, you know, cut right to the point. It measures soft skills, hard skills. Uh, typically, we encourage uh, uh, people to have, say, 10 to 14 raters. So you're getting boss, peers, reports, and you're getting it every which way. The criteria is that people know you well. You know, they, they work with you closely enough. Um, and the great thing about the Agile 360, it measures the Agile uh, competencies and behaviours from your personality profile. So we give you live feedback then about where you're strong and not so strong. So great alignment. And we've also captured the best of our uh, core uh, PBC 360, which contains our brilliant tables on strengths and opportunities and open text about strengths, opportunities and strengths being overused. So we would think that we've got a gold standard 360 here to ma match the gold standard with the personality assessment. I'm not going to go into the detail of the report. We are happy to show you sample reports. We're happy to give you the technical manual. Um, but today it was not meant to be a deep dive into the actual report. Some of you, I think, uh, were um, involved in our workshop last week where um, AJ took you through uh, the core of the report. So uh, as I start to wrap it up, and then we've got time maybe for a Q&A, coming back to today's operating environment, because everything I say today, I want to sort of talk about uh, the importance of agility in a leadership environment. Uh, I've been working with a lot of CEOs just in the last couple of weeks. So first of all, you need to look at the nature of the industry. Um, uh, COVID-19 and the recession has been an opportunity for some. Think food, uh, selling toilet rolls, uh, think medical. Uh, and on the other hand, for a lot of industries, it's cutbacks. So hospitality, retail, it's just been tragic and so sad to see premises shutting shutting their doors and having to lay people off. So when you're understanding what's going on, look at the nature of the industry. Is there opportunities or cutbacks? The second point, the strategy. I still want organisations to have a five year plan, a three year plan, a one year plan. Keep your planning cycle, but have a laser focus on the next 90 days. Uh, if, if, if we're heading into hard times and headwinds, really have that laser focus on the short term. What do we need to do now? What are our priorities? What work is in the pipeline? What are our customers experiencing? What's the financial impact? And I almost think this could be seven day reviews by the executive team. Um, the third dot point, if your business is stressed, uh, reach out to your clients, put yourself in their shoes. Uh, how are they traveling? What's their agenda? Will they be giving you work or not giving you work? What does your, your pipeline look like? And start to do a worst, worst case scenario plan. Like if it's all going pear shaped, what's the bottom line look like? And if we have to make savings, it's either the headcount or redundancies or cutting cost out of the business, you know, do it sooner rather than later so that you've got a leaner, meaner team that can still be there in the longer term. The fourth point, the top responsibility of a CEO is to have a high performing team. Uh, the team's got to be agile, resilient. Now more than ever, they need feedback. They need coaching, they need assessments. And that's where uh, PBC would be happy to support any of you that uh, want to take up these assessments. And then the responsibility of the high performing team is threefold, employee engagement, customer satisfaction, service operational excellence. Uh, it's about the bottom line. Um, and we know from the previous slides, this is not done well by everybody. We know there can be poor leaders, dysfunctional teams, uh, inexperience in delivering change. Um, so again, easier said than done. So a glimmer of hope from some new research that we've got. Um, I want to thank Lynn Cruikshank, my head of research here. She's just finished doing our um, 360 benchmarks uh, to put out the new manual. Happy to make this available to anybody. Just send us a, an email or ask for it. So what we've done is we've now got uh, 17,000 360s in our database, massive research. And we we use um, our strengths analysis at different levels of the organization. So this slide is showing you the strengths of a CEO executive board member, a divisional leader, a general manager, a frontline leader, and maybe an employee. 
And uh, this comes from our strengths table where we have 26 strengths and people pick four and we weight them four, three, two, one to actually come out with what is your number one strength. So the number one strength for, for uh, a CEO executive board member is working hard, for others it's second, but notice visionary and strategic is second, where it's 12th, 13th, 25th and 24th for everybody else. So what do you have to do when you're at the top of the tree? You've got to be visionary and strategic. Third comes strong leadership skills. It's third compared to 10, 9, 14, 22. So at the top of the tree, you've got to be a damn good leader and uh, showing the, the leadership competencies. Four is being competent. Uh, it slips to fourth at the top of the tree, but it's first for everybody else. And then competitive and determined is more elevated. So we're starting to see what do uh, really senior leaders look like? And these are the competencies we need to have for, for leaders and teams today. Um, and I'll show you another slide. Uh, and this is top quartile results. So what do our very best leaders look like at the top of the tree? And again, you can see the importance of strong leadership skills, being visionary and strategic, customer focused, motivational, and being able to set clear goals and drive results. So I, I've actually think that if you had to do a leadership program a day in the life of a CEO, the ones I've circled in blue is where we, you would concentrate the coaching and the uh, the competency building. So I think this is my final slide. So lessons for today, what do organisations need to do to build high performing teams and create the employee engagement? Uh, they've got to demonstrate strong leadership skills, be visionary and strategic, be motivational, set clear goals uh, and be competitive and determined. And this research is hot off the press. It's just come out in the last week or two and, and we think it unlocks a lot of secrets about uh, why senior and successful people do so well. Okay, I think I'm going to get my offside of Jar Jar to help me now if there's any questions. I'm looking at the clock, maybe we've got 10 minutes to go. Are there any questions? Yep, thanks, Peter. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jar Jar. I'm just moderating and um, providing your questions to Peter to answer. So, first up, Katrina has asked Who are some leaders that you think are doing particularly well at role modeling agile behaviors? Gee, that's a very good question, isn't it? Puts me on the spot. Um, I would say uh, companies that have been successfully disruptive in the last couple of years would be obviously agile organisations with great leaders. So uh, whether it's Uber disrupting the taxi industry, uh, Deliveroo or any other home deliveries that's changed the way we, we do food, uh, anyone who's been an innovative leader uh, that's created agility and disruption in the market, and they've got a good bottom line. Uh, Apple, I think, uh, are very agile by being an innovation leader. Um, and then you've got a lot of sort of boring businesses, the banks, um, I don't know, sort of a lot of business as usual. So uh, I would think the answer is have a look at those agile businesses that have disrupted the industry uh, by changing the whole behavior and pattern of doing business. And uh, that must have come from the CEO and the executive teams. Uh, and uh, I take my hat off to them. They're very good. I think what we're going to see in the next three months is a lot of other organisations now being faced with the imperative of be agile or, or be in trouble. So I think we're going to see a lot of fresh thinking, innovation, new technology. Um, so thank you, Katrina. I wish I could give more examples off the top of my head. Um, Matthew Modi from Broughton has asked, why do you think that so many employees are disengaged globally? And do you think that this has increased with COVID? Uh, wow, good question. So look, um, I have studied what all of the global uh, employee engagement survey providers put out there. Two thirds are engaged. They would not leave their organization for another employer. Uh, they give discretionary effort. They're a lot more positive and it shows up in safety, sales, productivity, retention. So one third are disengaged. Uh, my feeling is that the engagement comes from often your immediate manager. Shell think it's about 50% comes from your immediate manager. And if it's not your immediate manager, it could come from upper management where we don't trust them. They're not visible enough. They're not open and transparent with their communications. So the first thing I think is there's a lot of people who are prepared to quit their leader or the leadership. Two, I think it's team dynamics. 
I've picked up a lot of data over the years where people quit their team. If their team is dysfunctional, uh, bitching, backstabbing, disengaged, uh, favouritism, not accountable, uh, not dealing with poor performance, uh, those people just say, sorry, I, I've only got one life on this planet. I want to spend it with better people. The third level of disengagement would be your job. You can't see where your career is going. There's no development opportunities. There's no coaching or mentoring. Um, and people start to say, yes, I'm only half engaged. Uh, I work nine to five and if something else comes up, uh, I would uh, potentially look at it. Uh, how, how to build employee engagement? First of all, have it as a KPI in your strategic business plan. Our current level of engagement is here. We want to get it to there. That means getting into the root causes of what did the engagement survey show, uh, exit interviews, uh, putting some science into understanding it. And uh, uh, the research we've done is it shows that leadership drives engagement, which drives in, uh, performance. So you've got to set up your analytics. How do we measure leadership? Uh, how do we measure team effectiveness? How do we measure employee engagement and performance? And once you establish that causal link and know what gives you the engagement, you're on a journey then. But you're going to have to be pretty good at the people in business analytics, and most organisations are not. But uh, believe me, employee engagement pays. Uh, in the current climate, I think um, it's going to be hard to keep people highly engaged, particularly those working from home. There's, there's limited social interaction. You can't have those intact meetings. Uh, you can't celebrate successes shoulder to shoulder. So now more than ever, we've got to reach out to people and, and just uh, tap into their feelings and, and see how they're, how they're travelling. So that's a huge challenge. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Very good question. Um, Sandra from Juice has asked, can you talk more about how 360s can help my team be more agile? OK, so if you took the Agile 360, it would give you a score. That score would be benchmarked against other uh, managers or leaders in our database. So it would tell you, for example, you're at the top 90th percentile, you're doing brilliantly, keep doing it. You could be at the 75th percentile, very good, but a couple of opportunities to improve. Uh, or at the other end of the spectrum, you could be at the 25th percentile or 10th percentile and people don't think you're doing so well at all. So we tend to agree with Daniel Goldman on EQ. Uh, the first step is self-awareness. Self-awareness can only come from a diagnostic tool. It can't come from just a manager's feedback or the grapevine. Uh, so the assessment gives you a baseline. The beauty of our 360 is you go to the strengths and opportunities page and then you can do a development plan, how to leverage my strengths and what do I need to stop doing and start doing in relation to the opportunities that have been given to me. There's also written text, open text, the narrative, and uh, there'll be a power of insights in there uh, to, to give you that feedback. You should be coached. The coaching externally independently can help you put that development plan together. My preference is for a group of managers to all do the test and share their data. After all, the unit of performance is the team, not so much the individual. So give me a clean sheet of paper and I would say, I want to sit down with this management team, do the Agile personality, do the Agile 360, run a workshop for several hours. We can do that virtually and uh, there would be a power of learning that's going to help make them more effective leaders and more resilient, uh, more engaged, and then more match ready to go out and deal with their employees and customers. Uh, another very good question. Gee, these questions are good. I think there's time uh, for one or two more, Jaja. Yep. Next up is Peter. Can you please talk about when we would use the Agile Leader Assessments as opposed to the regular Hogan Assessments and 360 to look at leader capability? OK, wow, another good question. So look, we're proud of the whole suite of our uh, 360 products. Uh, in, a, in a general sense, you can't beat the standard Hogan 360 because it has such robustness, validity, benchmarks, you know, against 17,000 people, for example. Just at this point in time, if you're looking for something a little bit new, for something that resonates directly to the economic challenges facing most industries, the, the Agile 360 is measuring what it's meant to measure, uh, the competencies and behaviours from the personality test. It's, it's sort of the right time, the right product. Uh, I think you can put a business case for introducing it to a team. Hey guys, we're flying into headwinds. We've been massively disrupted. We need to be agile and resilient. There are these Agile products and uh, it doesn't take long to go online and get the data and, and give the feedback. 
and then have that team building session. So I just think where organisations are saying we need to be agile, we need to be nimble, we need to be fast paced, then I think this product is uh, is worth its weight in gold. But the other products are damn good too. It's just that this one I think uh, is would hit the sweet spot just at the moment. Uh, next up, Justin has asked, what suggestions do you have for implementing agile leadership, including using our assessments into smaller organisations who may not have a process or data driven culture? Can you just read the question one more time, Jar Jar? I missed one word. Yep, so um, Justin has asked, what suggestions do you have for implementing agile leadership, including using our assessments into smaller organisations who may not have a process or data driven culture? OK, very good. So um, it would, I would need to ask you the size of the business. How many employees have you got? Let's say it was a, a company with, say, 40 people to 100 people or thereabouts. Uh, my assumption would be you'd have a management team of, say, five to eight people, and I would start with that management team. Uh, I would do both the personality and the 360 because you get the why and the what below the waterline, above the waterline. And I always say, give me the personality in the 360 and there's no place to hide. I've got all the data I need for a good coaching intervention. Uh, so just start with that, that senior team and do it as a team event, uh, meaning we're going to have a team building a session. Could be two hours here and two hours there. Um, and we can do it virtually, but you would be presenting that data back. By agreement, they would agree to share their data because a high performing team is trusting and vulnerable and, and open to that. Uh, constructive feedback. Um, you could then, if you wanted to, use just the personality profile, the agile personality profile for the whole of your team. So that would then give the whole workforce uh, something to come together around, um, being a team, sharing the conversation. So next Monday, for example, I'm coaching a cohort of 33 people. It's all virtual. And uh, they happen on this occasion to have done the three classic Hogan's, the bright side, the dark side, the inside. We've set aside a two and a half hour workshop. Uh, it is being done virtually. We've had to change the way we present, uh, but the decision was made. We need to give those people something during these difficult times to understand themselves and how do they cope with stress? Uh, uh, what's their dark side? How might they succumb if there's too much pressure? So if you care about the management team and the workforce, now is a great time to do some of these assessments, to invest in people, show that we care, and uh, and keep their engagement a bit higher. Uh, Peter, just to clarify, Justin has said that um, the company is in professional services and there's 1,500 employees. Oh, wow. That's, uh, well, boy, we've got a lot of assessments to sell there then. So, uh, Justin, my, my tip would then be, let's do the team one, which is the executive, uh, and that might be um, you know, eight to 12 people, and then do teams two. So the direct reports to the CEO would be part of that first event because they're on the executive. Then they lead a team, and I call this teams two. So you'd potentially be doing the top 70 or 80 people in the business. Now, I'm working with a client at the moment, Sydney Trains, and that's exactly the approach we're taking. We do team one, we do two teams two, because the top eight to 10 people can't drive the transformational change for 1500. You're going to need teams one and teams two so that you've got 80, 90 people doing the heavy lifting and, uh, and that would work perfectly there. Yep. Uh, one of the participants has also asked if we're able to share the research on which the Agile Leader model is based. Um, so in regards to that, we can certainly share the research with you. It's also included in their technical manual. One of our team will be in touch with all the participants post this webinar and yep. share the research. Yeah, totally. And that research, because IMD put their name on it, it's one of the most prestigious schools in Europe. We had to have a lot of science and validity behind this. And as Jar Jar said, we're happy to send you, send you the technical manual. Yep. Um, Jen from Smartbox has asked, when would I use the Agile 360 versus the Agile Personality Report? Um, well, I'm biased because I think the two go together like bookends. Um, you know, it, you take the 360, 
by itself fantastic. The personality will inform in most occasions why some of the home behaviour has come out. So then you're saying, well, there's a core personality, but we need to change some of the, the behaviour. We need to modify the behaviour. Um, they're, they're terrific by themselves. It just depends on your budget, the time that you've got, uh, how small or big is the intervention. Um, they're both great tools. Uh, often we start with one and then move to the second. So sometimes I'll say, people will say, let's start with the 360. That was a great experience. Let's not go back and do the personality or vice versa. I think it's a question of establishing our credibility. The fact that it's high impact, uh, it, it really does hit the mark with people. They enjoy the experience. They think it was really professional development, uh, feedback for them. Uh, so look, I can't say there's any science to using one or the other. Uh, I guess the 360 is a little bit sharper because it gives you a score and that score could be fantastic or not so good. And if it's not so good, it's a wake up call. Whereas the, the, the personality is predictive of behavior, but it doesn't measure your reputation in the workplace. That can only be done with the 360. So uh, um, God willing, we'd have both. But if not, mm, gee, hard call, possibly start with the 360. Uh, just one final question, Peter, uh, from Hiltrude. When do we use the Hogan 360 and when do we use the Hogan Agile 360? Okay. All right. Gee, very good questions today. This is fantastic. Eh? I'm a lucky boy being able to talk to such good people. Uh, look, you can always use the Hogan 360. It, it is the gold standard. It's the generic 360. It's the most powerful. It's beautifully put together. It's a 30 page report. Uh, you know, we've got 17,000 people in our benchmark database. Uh, you know, it's, it's right out there as a gold standard in the world. Uh, so the Agile, the Agile was designed for innovative businesses uh, that want to be a disruptor, that want to go down the path of working with more Agile structures like tribes, um, uh, you know, getting a cross-functional uh, one-off project teams going. And now I think it's becoming popular because of the, the current difficult economic situation where we're having to be agile, nimble, fast, disruptive, uh, you know, agiles for everybody, not the few. So I just think that the agile uh, can deliver immediate impact if your organization is facing disruption and change and you wanna know immediately and quickly uh, how open and capable they are about driving that change. So, it could be that the Agile products are just absolutely right you know, for the next six months. Uh, but equally, you know, you can't go past the traditional Hogan 360 if you're looking more broadly around the concept of holistic development and uh, using it with the HPI, HDS, MVPI, team assessments, and then that LEAP model, leadership, engagement, agility, performance, target to employee engagement, uh, and, and giving a return on investment. So, uh, so the Hogan 360 would be, uh, yeah, the, the big kahuna, uh, but the Agile is cherry ripe just for the economic environment for the next six months. Maybe even easy to sell to a client that's going through a lot of change. Hey, have we got some good products for you that will measure our agility and, and create some coaching and, and, and team development? Uh, I think that's all the questions we've got today, so we can kind of wrap up. Can I just thank everyone, Jar Jar? I know everybody's very busy. I was thrilled to see people from Mexico, the USA, uh, some of our uh, very good Australian friends. Uh, so thank you so much for giving up your time. And if you've got any questions, don't be shy. Don't be a stranger. We're here to help you. Thank you and goodbye.